So, John, before we jump into it today, I read this morning that Nancy Pelosi has requested that President Trump postpone Mm -hmm. his State of the Union address because it might be inappropriate to do while the government is shut down, and it might be a security concern given that the Secret Service has not been paid. So that made me think about our State of the Union, which we're definitely planning to still do. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to remind our listeners... What is the State of the Union, and why should they tune in? That's right, Kieran. I don't know if the president is going to be doing a State of the Union or not, but Better Angels definitely will be. And you got to check it out, Ken, because this is going to be the hot event at the end of January. Uh, But for everybody listening and for anybody who doesn't know, Better Angels is having a State of the Union event. We're having our own State of the Union address. Uh, meaning that the president of the organization, David Blankenhorn, he is going to be giving a uh, State of the Union address laying out a new vision for American politics. It's not us taking positions on, you know, X, uh, Y, and Z policy issues, but it is going to be us articulating the Better Angels philosophy and challenging people from the grassroots to the halls of Congress to treat each other uh, in a different and more elevated kind of way so we can rehabilitate this political discourse and depolarize America. So, Kieran, and maybe you ought to give people the details on that and let them know uh, where they can find it and how they can get involved. Bada bing, bada boom. Mm. I like the way you talk. Thank you, sir. But yeah, January 31st, the live stream starts at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. John and I are going to be emceeing a little Oscars-like pre-show. We're going to be showing some videos. We're going to bring a couple people up who are going to be at the home where we're filming. Mm -hmm. So be sure to tune into that. It's the first time we've directed and produced something. I think it's going to be really fun. Mm. And then we're going to get into the actual address at 9 p.m. So you can find the live stream on our website at better-angels.org. You can find it on our Facebook. You can find it on YouTube. And if you're super interested in the State of the Union, you can actually host your own watch party. So you can invite your own friends. We'd love for you to reach out to a couple friends who you disagree with politically, but you don't have to. Have them over, have a couple drinks, we'll have a couple exercises you can do with your guests if you want to sort of set the scene, and then tune into the live stream, put it up on your TV, watch the address, then talk about how you felt, Um, have another drink if you want, have a muffin, (laughs) have a crudite. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. be sure to tune in, and let's jump back into it. Check it out, get involved. Welcome to the Better Angels Podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. And I'm John Wood Jr. John, who else we got here today? We have one of my favorite people (laughs) in the whole wide world. My friend, Kim Iverson. How you doing today, Hi, Kim? thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's great to be here. 100%. And for folks who don't know you, although many of the people listening, I think, will know you because they may very well have heard you, uh, if not on the left uh, network, which you are the co-founder of, uh, or in your previous uh, iteration as a, a nationally syndicated talk radio show host yeah. prior to that, uh, people in Better Angels might know you as uh, from your appearance on Make America Relate Again with yeah. Sammy Amounts. Uh, shout out to our friend Samia, and uh, where you were, I think, on with my uh, good buddy Nick Hancock yeah. from the Republican Liberty Cox. Uh, shout out to Nick as well. So Kim may very well be a familiar uh, voice for people listening, uh, but Kim is a media entrepreneur. Uh, she has had a uh, a, a very interesting career in media, uh, in political media in particular. Uh, but Kim is a free thinker. She's a person who doesn't really, uh, uh, she's no wilting violet, I guess, put it like that, in terms of, <laughs> of making your opinions uh, known. But Kim is also one to think outside the box. So super happy to have you on today. Well, thank you. Thanks mm-hmm. for having me here. Totally. Um, so, you know, uh, there are a few things that are, that strike me as interesting about your politics in particular, Kim. And so, you know, here at Better Angels, of course, I mean, the the thing that we focus on is trying to not get people to abandon their partisan positions, but to be open to sort of the perspectives of people on the other side so we can give ourselves the opportunity to find common ground by highlighting the values that we may have in common. And that doesn't happen unless people listen to each other and are open to the possibility of respecting each other. And the thing that strikes me about your politics from what I've heard of, from you and from our conversations over the over the last couple of years. It's been the fact that, one, I mean, 
obviously you're co-founder of the left. And right. So for the, <laughs> right. So in general, I mean, if, if folks are paying attention to, to what you're talking about, not too many people are going to confuse you for, you know, for a Republican or a conservative. Although you do, you have told me that sometimes people do hit you with the right wing. Oh, yeah. I get called a far right or right winger on a regular basis <laughs> just because mm-hmm. being, you know, thinking for myself, I guess, mm-hmm. um, I've, I've come to some conclusion on conclusions on some things that mm-hmm. maybe people think oh that's more in line with you know with what they consider to be the far right or right. Yeah. something so and so as a republican myself i've had people uh, conservatives and so forth call me call me a liberal or call me yeah. uh, you know I mean, closet progressive and so forth because i i think that somebody on the left actually makes a good point about something i think it's you know? just an easy uh, name to call someone mm-hmm. when you don't agree with what they're mm-hmm. saying right. it's just easy to then say mm-hmm. you know if you're a liberal to be like oh you're a right winger you know because mm-hmm. i don't agree with what you're saying or same thing on the you know vice versa if you're mm-hmm. on the right and you hear somebody say something you don't agree with you're like oh you liberal right <laughs> kieran, i think that's just the kieran, way it goes kieran is this some grief that you get sometimes uh you ever get called a right winger you ever get, yeah, you ever get called <laughs> yeah a, well called i a, mean <laughs> especially since working with better angels i mean i've gotten criticism from both sides for sort of my whole time in politics i think it's a, a symptom in some ways of the tribalism mm-hmm. um you know people question your ideological convictions there's a sense that somehow even engaging with a different perspective is akin to surrendering your own yeah mm. and it's like how dare you fraternize with the enemy yeah um and heaven forbid you actually see any value in the other perspective right? but i think that's i think that's rare i actually think most people recognize the value of uh engaging with other perspectives particularly when they give it a shot themselves mm-hmm because it actually forces you to challenge your own thinking values and generally helps you strengthen them. Yeah. The way in which you think about them, the way in which you can articulate them, because you're able to put yourself in the shoes of someone who has had a different life experience and you're not just speaking to um, the echo chamber. Well, Kim, right. and, and and I think just judging off of things I've heard you say, I think that you're essentially one of those one of those people because I mean you know for whatever it is some people may say about you I mean I know you to definitely be a liberal right to, to, to yeah. definitely be a person whose larger political sentiments go in a leftward direction and, and well that's, yeah know. I mean I would definitely say I am a liberal mm-hmm. like a real liberal right and I mm-hmm. don't necessarily think other liberals are actually liberal okay well maybe we can, <laughs> maybe we can get into that yeah. a little bit and i and but, i believe i'm truly on the left and i don't necessarily mm. think that everybody who thinks they're on the left is really on the left so it's kind of oh, got yeah. you, got you. So, okay. which is why there's that confusion then sometimes and they'll think oh you're a right winger right okay yeah. so there's so there's some categorical parsing we might do a bit yeah but the thing i was just going to highlight is the fact that even though even though you are a, even though you are a liberal right yeah uh, but i've also heard you say and you know i it, I've, you know, I, I've definitely heard you be fiercely critical of the Republican Party uh, and the Democratic Party, for that matter. Yeah. But definitely critical of the Republican Party, President Trump, etc. But I've also heard you say that, as critical as you are of the Republican Party, uh, you don't believe it's healthy for people from either party to go into political conversations or negotiations um, with an attitude that says, "Because you are not my party, you are you are my enemy." Whether that's explicit or implicit, uh, I've heard you make points along the line to say that that is not the way to operate a functioning sort of democracy. Uh, no, it's society. un-American. If you ask me, it's flat out un-American. Right. Okay. To call a Republican the enemy is mm-hmm. un-American to me. They're yeah. not the enemy. Well, mm-hmm. that harkens back to the original. Lincoln quote on which Better Angels is based, um, you know, his first inaugural address addressing a nation on the brink of civil war, he started by saying, we are not enemies. Mm. We must not be enemies. Right. And then proceeded to talk about the importance of summoning the better angels of our nature. So mm. I think that yeah. point is very well taken and, and very much in line with um, our values and what we're trying to hope excuse me, what we're hoping to mm. spread across the country. Yeah. Well, for me, that's just that's just so much common sense. And, you know, when I was running for Congress, uh, and, you know, folks know I ran against Maxine Waters in 2014. I ran as a Republican and so forth. But, I mean, I, 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 really, I really sort of 
chafed at the idea that the folks on the other side of the political conversation, even Congresswoman Waters, were necessarily you know anti-American because they subscribe to another sort of political uh, political philosophy. But sometimes you do have to fight a little bit to stand on that conviction that even though the people I disagree with are people I do disagree with, at the end of the day, we want to set it up to where we can recognize each other as fundamentally being on the same team because if we don't see each other in that way, then we're going to start treating each other like enemies and that justifies yeah. cheating, it justifies lying, it justifies corruption, it justifies all these right. other things. So before I go too deep into a spiel on that, I, I was curious to ask you um, sort of what is it in your own personal, I don't know, is there something in your background or your experience which allows you to walk this line that other people have a difficult time walking on the left Hmm. and the right, namely that you on the one hand are committed to your perspective and you believe in your values and views, but on the other hand, your passion in favor of your ideas does not lead to hatred against those people who have a very different point of view. What is it about you that allows you to kind of look at things that way well and first of all i just want to point out that Mm. i there's a difference between being Mm. against an individual and being against an entire group Mm. so i Mm. I do think it's un-american to say republicans are the enemy however Mm. if there are individuals of Mm. any of anywhere Mm. who are uh who do things that are despicable Mm. in any way Mm. shape or form or treasonous right then there is that Mm. so i do want to make that Mm. distinction there that there you can be Mm. against individuals you just can't Mm. be against group Mm. groups of people Mm. which fundamentally i think Mm. is just so wrong right to point out an entire group and say Mm. everybody in this group is evil everybody Mm. in this group is bad fair enough um Mm. i would say with my background you know, I just have, I, I, I've I been really lucky, kind of like you, John, being mm. a mixed person. <laughs> so when you're mixed ethnically, you mm. automatically are born into a perspective. You're, you're forced into a split perspective, whether you like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've got to relate mm. to two very different groups of people. Mm. Um, and it starts from birth, so you're constantly having to do this like, okay, I'm with this side of my family now, so I've got to mm. understand this that's mm. going on. And, and, and what, is, what is your, your background? I'm half Vietnamese. Right. Mm. So my mom's side of the family, they are Vietnamese refugees. Mm. So they have mm. asylum status here in the United States. Mm. So there's that. They're Republicans. Mm-hmm. There's also that. <laughs> oh, they're Vietnamese. <laughs> they're, yeah, Republicans. Vietnamese community is largely okay. Republican. Oh, I uh, yeah. didn't really realize yep, that. Yeah, largely mm. Republican. Why do you think that is? Ford, President Ford, they love him. You know, he was the one who helped them mm-hmm. um, and gave them a lot of assistance and support. Mm-hmm. And Coming was to the United States, very after welcoming. Vietnam. Uh huh. Yeah, it. Republican president. Very, mm-hmm. very welcoming, mm-hmm. uh, very generous, and really helped them get on their feet. Mm-hmm. And so the Vietnamese community loves President Ford, and they're forever Republican, pledging their allegiance to the Republican Party wow. because of the help that they got from sure. Republicans right. mm-hmm. when they were seeking refuge. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Um, even though a lot of that sentiment has changed within the Republican Party, the loyalty, for one, I think a lot of people in the Vietnamese community are not that political. Mm. They're not necessarily following the politics and the, mm. they're definitely not getting into the mudslinging. Mm-hmm. Right. And so they're just kind of like, well, Republicans. Also, you know, Vietnamese community, especially when you're refugees, you've got to really figure out how to make it, mm. right? right? You're coming from nothing. Right. And what happens is a lot of... Um, and I say this about, you know, they, they, they always point to, oh, look what's going on in Europe right now with all of the Syrian refugees that are coming in and they're seeing a rise in crime. Mm. You're going to see that, obviously, because anytime people are poor and struggling, there's going to be an uptick in crime. Mm. And I could tell you all kinds of stories from when I was a kid growing up in the Vietnamese community. We got robbed mm-hmm. at gunpoint. Well, mm. I don't know if there has been an uptick in crime. My impression is that statistically crime is going down and crimes are less likely to be perpetrated by immigrants than the native-born. I would think the after a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think, think it's interesting um, what you said, because I think now, given the views of the modern GOP, people are prone to sometimes automatically assume that it, if someone is an immigrant, they're going to vote Democrat. But I think there is this strong strain of self-reliance Yeah. and those sorts of values which have traditionally been claimed by conservatives although i actually like think pull yourself up by the bootstraps and do it yourself right and i don't yeah. think that's actually incompatible with liberalism uh insofar as it's been classically defined right but i'd be curious on the immigration issue given your background and your career how do you sort of feel about the current divide in terms of 
immigration outlook and also how that's been represented during the Trump administration, because obviously it's become a lot more personal, yeah. um, a lot more categorical, as we were saying before. So I'd be curious, given the background you were just talking about, how you feel about both immigration policy generally, President Trump's actions and rhetoric on immigration, yeah, and then the current immigration fight within the shutdown and everything we're seeing today. I'm sure nothing controversial is going to come out of this conversation. No, no. <laughs> well, first of all, um, family separation is despicable. Mm -hmm. So that that is so horrendous. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't even imagine just thinking of my family coming over mm -hmm. and my mom and my cousin. And I was actually the first one born in the United States on mm -hmm. my mom's side of the family. Mm -hmm. My mom is, is still not an American citizen. Um, so I could be considered an anchor baby, I guess is what you could call me. Um, I, I, I couldn't imagine my family being torn apart mm -hmm. coming over here and being separated. I think mm -hmm. that that is absolutely atrocious. That being said, um, it, you know, we, we definitely have to solve immigration. Um, I actually have a very liberal viewpoint where I, I'm, and I, this is definitely, I wanna make this clear, this is not a democratic mm -hmm. principle. Right. Uh, Democrats do not agree with me on this. Liberals do not agree with me on this. This is just me. Mm -hmm. I am for open borders. Mm -hmm. I do not think we should have the strict immigration that we have. I think that mm -hmm. human, mig for one, um, immigration and borders and all of that is very new. It's a very new man-made concept. Mm -hmm. Humans have been migrating around the world like animals for thousands of years. It's part of nature mm -hmm. to flee heat and famine and um, oppression wherever you might be. This is natural to migrate around. Mm -hmm. Do I think that means we don't document people and we don't figure out who's who and where they're coming from and maybe even do some vetting and say, okay, look, you, we have some standards. You're not allowed to be here if you've committed. All, you know, if you're fleeing and you're a murderer coming from somewhere, then obviously we don't want you here. Right. Um, I do think that there should be some vetting, but by and large, I am for open borders because I don't think people are really gonna, it's not like we're gonna see floods of people coming into our country, we saw this with Europe and the European Union. When Greece fell, how many Greeks ran off to Germany? Mm. It just wasn't that many, mm. because people don't do that. They wanna stay where they're from. They wanna have grandma's cooking. They want their neighborhood. They want their friends. They want their home. People don't, by and large, pack up and leave. It's about 10 to 15% of the world that would actually have a people that have the personality to, mm. I wanna go somewhere else that has nothing to do with where I've been, and in a place where I don't know anybody, it's really not that big of a population. So I think it creates an environment where, for one, regimes would fall because if they knew the people would be welcome in other places, they would have to get their act together pretty quick. You can't have a regime or a government without people to govern. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's well, it's, it's an interesting. What's interesting about the issue uh, to me, and you know, you and I have talked about this issue, I think, a little bit in the past, and I'm definitely a person who's more in favor of controlled immigration. And I yeah. think of myself as being a bit more conservative on this issue. But what strikes me about it is the fact that, I mean, Karen, you referenced, uh, you know, the, the, the current GOP and Trump's posture on immigration. And obviously, you know, it's it's a very restrictive sort of sort yeah, of Yeah, it's built that, on racism. I do think Trump, that it's uh, like playing into... Be taken on that. Yeah, this racism idea. Yeah, well, and, and it's and it's easy it's easy to see how anybody who does have sort of a xenophobic kind of perspective, and I don't think that that's at all necessarily characteristic of the majority of Republicans or conservatives. But I mean, definitely there is a certain number of people who do just on sheer tribal lines feel that way, I and think I think all that, of us do. I, I think that. Yeah, well, there's an argument too that there's just sort of an innate mechanism or, or sort of uh, we want to be uh, around people who are similar brain, to us, right? Yeah, I think yeah, the we, humans have, we are... have a certain uh, comfort with right. people who are who are like us. But but the, just, the only point I was going to make really quickly is that if you look at the history of of the parties, and and I know you're not speaking for the Democratic Party, no, or anything they're not like for that. open borders. I need to make that clear, right? But 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 it's just but but it is interesting. <laughs> Maybe because in the we, closet, a bunch of them are. 
Well, but I we, don't know. But it's just it's really it's really not a partisan issue fundamentally. I mean, in the moment it may look like that, but you go back a few years. You know, George W. Bush he wasn't for open borders, but he was looking to very much sort of liberalize immigration policy in terms of conferring amnesty and so forth. And yeah, he received blowback from people in his own party, but he represented a substantial number of Republicans who were in favor of that idea. People like Rick Perry and so forth. And you go back not too far in the history of the Democratic uh, Party. I mean, I think that even Bill Clinton was was talking about the importance of controlling immigration. You go back to the 60s uh, and, um, um, oh, goodness gracious, uh, um, uh, well, Cesar Chavez, not not an American, but, uh, uh, um, and uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s chief deputy. Why is his name escaping me? You had a lot of uh, liberal activists in those years, uh, and Bernie Sanders, uh, up until very recently, reflected this in his own attitudes, saying that, uh, undocumented immigration or illegal immigration, uh, a massive influx of working class people was very bad uh, for the American worker because it represented competition that would bring down uh, bring down uh, wages. Right. And on the other hand, you had many business people and corporate interests, and you know many interests aligned with the Republican Party who were in favor of bringing in these workers and therefore opening up the border policy for precisely that reason. So the only reason I kind of go through that history. Uh, a little bit uh, is to just sort of highlight the fact that given the fact that these positions switch, we shouldn't look at a person as having who has a, either a left of center or a right of center position on immigration as being just kind of categorically, you know. No, it's like an ebb and flow, I think, throughout history. It's been, mm-hmm. you know, a push pull on immigration for sure. I just yeah. personally think it's I think it's personally unethical and immoral to tell people where they can and cannot live. Mm. And the only way open borders would ever work, um, I'm not advocating for that in the US government because the only way it would ever work is if Mm. the entire world had open borders. Mm. And there was a convention in Rome back in the 1800s where world leaders got together and they said that. They said, Mm. it is actually immoral to tell people where they can and cannot live. Who am I to say you cannot leave my walls? Mm. Or who am I to say you're not allowed into my walls? You know, it's... It is a, a bit, you know, to tell a person like what, you know, if I, I happen to date a lot of European guys, I can't move <laughs> to Europe unless I marry one of them. And right. that was a problem in one of my relationships. He was right. German. And the only way that we could really be together was if we got married. It was going to force us into a premature situation mm-hmm. that we weren't ready for mm-hmm. because neither of us could live in each other's country. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, he would have been over here in a productive member of society, or I would have been over there in a productive member of society. Mm-hmm. And yet we're told that we're not allowed mm-hmm. for, you know, for governmental reasons mm-hmm. to, you know, we're not allowed to live. I mean, to me, as long as you're a productive member of society, then you should be able to live wherever you're going to live. Now, and I put that caveat on there. You've got to be a productive member mm. of society or supported by a productive member of society. Mm. On a fundamental level, it really like resonates with me. And I think when you also think about American identity, we've always been, or at least aspired to be, a nation of immigrants and a nation that was obviously built on immigration, primarily from Europe, but also from around the world, and sort of being a beacon. And obviously... As we've grown, people have tended to also think about national sovereignty, think about security. Obviously, we've been a superpower. And so we've had sort of a leg up on a lot of these other countries that are a lot poorer. Yeah. And I think to your point about, you know, there's always going to be a a limit on the percentage of people that want to leave. I think that's generally true. But I think if you think about immigrants who are fleeing violence or persecution, if you think about countries like El Salvador right. or Honduras, that percentage is going to go up a lot. And sure. I think that's what's been creating sort of this influx of immigrants who are um, trying to come to the United States because they're seeking a better life, as you said. So I think it's a tricky issue, but on a fundamental level, I, I definitely agree. We're all human, and part of our evolution is transcending this tribal nature because we no longer need to be in tribes of 30, 40 to people where if you let someone else in, you could die and they could take your whole it's stuff. Also yeah, right? genetically, I, 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 it's also genetically unhealthy. 
you know, like scientifically, <laughs> it's unhealthy mm. to keep your tribe, uh, just your tribe, and continue mating with one another. Let's mix up the gene We're pool. We're supposed mix to, up the gene pool right? a little bit. Mother right? Nature it's, built uh, that into cat- the system. You yeah. have to introduce new genes. Right. And the only way mm-hmm. to do that is by migrating mm-hmm. and, and merging. Mm-hmm. And we have to be able to do that. Otherwise, we will, we're literally, I mean, this is like going way beyond, and I gr- realize this is not in our lifetime, but we're like creating a catastrophic event for humans by saying, we're going to put up borders. We're not going to allow migration. We're not going to allow mixing. This creates a couple of problems. You've got um, with global warming, right? You've got you're putting people in positions of famine where they can't leave. Mm-hmm. Where where oh, you're looking thousand, way down the line. Well, right, but but still, well, that's you know, already happening think now. in like Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. Right, climate change sure. is sparking massive mm-hmm. migration and, and refugee crises. So same thing. And like it's something in, that the I Defense just, Department has looked at and is making plans for. Well, I mean, but you know, I was just in the Italy. Conversation is. Um, for three months, here. and but, Venice is under attack because of the cl- because of climate change. Mm-hmm. Venice, Italy, is literally going underwater, and um, it is top of mind for Italians cl- mm-hmm. global warming. Mm-hmm. So for them, you know, imagine if the Venetians couldn't migrate. Mm-hmm. Imagine if people if if they weren't part of Italy and they were their mm-hmm. own little nation, and everybody put up walls and mm-hmm. said you're not allowed to migrate, and they're literally sinking. Mm-hmm. They're or going Syria. underwater. You know, right. you're literally dying. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, so, I'm, I'm, I'm all. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm, being, I'm, I'm all in favor for for inter- intermixing and catalyzing right. these evolutionary adaptations back. and so um, forth. Well, but let me let me just, yeah. if you don't mind, just make a quick point because I agree with what you said, Kieran, about the imperative of transcending transcending the limits of tribalism and so forth. But I also agree with what you said, Kim, that we do have a natural instinct uh, to do precisely that. In other words we do tend to feel more comfortable around people with whom we are more familiar. Yeah, and that's it, natural. It, you know, and it seems to me, look, I, 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 in theory, I wouldn't be opposed to the idea of the free movement of people across borders, totally unrestricted, if we had the condition that you laid out, which is to say that we have this sort of universal recognition of our common kind of human similarity and so forth, and we had just sort of a degree of comfort that would allow that to happen without friction. But I do think that that basic thing you're pointing to points to the core subject of our concern, which is this issue of polarization and so forth, in as much as I think that even... Because the United States of America is, is actually pretty intermixed society and so forth. We're looking at dramatic demographic shifts taking place. But we're also witnessing a type of tribalism that has become ideologically entrenched uh, in ways that obviously reflect the nature of people's cultural and maybe ethnic and racial experiences and religious, etc. But that is also, I think, in some sense, artificially stimulated yeah. by the sort of incentive structures of the political establishment and the media and whatnot. Mm. It's like they're pricking our what our limbic system yeah. and whatnot to get us to constantly be in that tribal uh, tribal uh, oppositional posture against each other. Well, that's what I was going other. to kind of say. Is yeah, that so I want to know, like, how do you, you know, what do you sort of attribute that to? What's happening in our system that's that's uh, pricking that nerve over and over again, yeah. and making this so intense? Well, um, first, you know, on immigration, I do want to point out something that. Um, even though I have really far left views on a lot of those things, mm-hmm. one thing that I want to, uh, kind of speaking with the tribalism, people see the things in the media and they automatically say, oh my gosh, you know, the GOP and the right wingers, look what they're doing mm-hmm. in regards to the camps. Mm-hmm. So my mom was in one of those camps, right? When she came over, they had to spend time in a camp mm-hmm. um, before they were able to fully process into the United States. Mm-hmm. And you know, people look at those camps, they say, look at the conditions of those camps, like how awful and how are we keeping people in this and this is terrible. Mm-hmm. And from my mom's perspective, she saw these and she's like, this is, these are great. You know, this is way <laughs> better than what we got. You know, this is like so much better than, and, and also to it's her point, yeah, and to her point and to the point yeah. of a lot of people is, you know, and I'm not saying that living in these camps is a great thing, yeah. but it is for a lot of these people way better than where they're coming from. Mm. They're finally getting fed, they're finally getting a bed and they're getting safety that they didn't have before. So even though we don't want them in there forever, by any means, you don't want to keep people in a concentration camp. Yeah. The whole point is like when my my mom was in them for nine months mm-hmm. is that you go you process and you get out like you right. you enter into society it's a place for you to kind of get on your feet mm-hmm. for them to kind of educate you on the laws you know the, the laws of the land mm-hmm. teaching you some English right. um, getting you set up with where in the United States are they going to place you mm-hmm. that's what happened with the Vietnamese refugees they actually spread them out across the country um, was your mother with children in the camps her my children? mom was a child I see yeah my mom was 12 mm-hmm. yeah. so 
Interesting. Yeah, or 14, Mm -hmm. 12 or 14. And her conditions were pretty bad. I mean, back then she was like saying that she remembers soldiers watching her shower. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the issues is that the the restrictionist Mm -hmm. rhetoric can also sort of morph into dehumanization. Yeah. So there's a lot of times this kind of undergirding sentiment that when you look at it objectively is valuing American life more than the lives of people from other nations. And so it's like, how do you square that with, you know, the president's first responsibility is to protect Americans. Mm -hmm. So how do you square that with um, the idea that all human lives are Mm -hmm. inherently of equal value? Well, it's a, it's a tough line to walk. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously in order for us to have a functional conversation about that, we need a context where we're not dehumanizing each other just because we might have a different starting point. So so that's why I was curious to ask you. Well, right. Looking at these camps and then all the, you know, automatically saying, wow, this is horrible. The rhetoric is creating the division, mm-hmm. right? So if you create this rhetoric of, oh my God, they're putting people in camps and this is horrible, it then makes the other side, you know, all of a sudden you have to, you're escalating a battle to where then it does dehumanize these people. Mm-hmm. If the conversation was, instead of focusing on the camps, but focusing on, okay, how do, this is, we're getting them out of, the, this is a transitional space. Mm-hmm. This is not okay. the space yeah. they're meant to be in forever. We're not locking people away. We're mm-hmm. transitioning them in and out you know, having a conversation of how quickly can we transition them out rather than, oh my gosh, you know, pointing fingers at one mm, another. It's actually, it's, it's not doing these people any good. Mm. You know, we need to have a different conversation and, and it's not, mm. you know, because where are you going to place people for nine months or however long? Um, you know, so I, I do think in going to that, that, you know, there there are some, we do kind of end up having these fights that, you know, mud fights that I don't necessarily think we need Mm -hmm. to have and we're not looking at things from a perspective that's Mm -hmm. realistic. Mm. Um, But at the same time, yeah, I do have those really far left Well, ideally it wouldn't be nine months. Mm -hmm. I mean, given the the budget of the United States, you'd think we could, you know, invest in more resources at ports of entry and more immigration judges to start processing people quicker because i don't think in 2019 in america you should have to wait in a camp nine months to get your asylum claim it's not really well yeah on that front i agree with you on that it's just more of like where are you going to transition them to you know Mm. that you've got to make sure that they have a place set up that they have employment that they have a community that they have um the resources that they need Mm -hmm. you know and that's what was going on with the vietnamese and it took them about nine months Mm. so i see what you're saying and 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 that's really the nature of the crisis on the border to the extent that there is a crisis right now it's not so much that the number of immigrants coming has has escalated it's it's diminished but the number of families have grown and our capacity to be able to you know first of all humanely house people temporarily but then to be able to process them and transition them over to the other side if only to wait for a hearing and so forth yeah has been totally sort of overstrained. And so obviously to your point, Kieran, it seems like some additional resources could help make that happen. But again, if the if the politics of the moment is set up to where any compromise between the de- Republicans and the Democrats yeah, is a I mean, political loss, you know, uh, with their base or with whoever, whatever interests are supporting them, uh, then there's just, there's, there's just no way to govern uh, effectively. No productive agreement uh, could possibly be on the horizon. And, and, yeah, and therefore, we can't we're still in the midst of this. Go- exactly. <laughs> you know, so we're still, about it. Right. And so how long has the government shutdown been going on now at this moment? Oh, it's, it's like seven days. Yeah. Oh, just gosh. just lost, lost count, right? Um, but now, you know, there's a pretty, an emerging bipartisan majority mm-hmm. in the Senate that's trying to push legislation to say, well, mm-hmm. let's open the government for three more weeks and mm-hmm. then that'll give us a little bit of space and breathing room to try to negotiate mm-hmm. a basic compromise, you know, that could pair increased funding for border security with, say, pathway to citizenship for the mm-hmm. dreamers. Right. So. Gotcha. I sort of see that as kind of the only yeah, that solution, is. barring Trump uh, declaring a national emergency, which it seems like he's backed away from in the past few days. Right. Yeah, and I'd, I'd be in favor of a compromise like that, just 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 myself, and hopefully, you know. But it should, never should have taken this much pain to get to a point to where something like that might even be possible. I, we're not even there yet. So hopefully, uh, in our next episode, we're not still talking about <laughs> about this the issue. The shutdown. Right? Yeah, the shutdown. Oh God, man, we've been on that going on forever. Yeah. Uh, but just sort of in a general sense, though, yeah. I mean, do you, do you look at the, uh, the the broader political polarization in general and the governmental dysfunction in particular? Is that a 
is that a proximal consequence of the media? Is it a consequence of changes that have happened in terms of how the, the Congress operates or how the politicians interact with either their constituents or donors? I mean, do you see there as being sort of structural, systematic uh, factors at play that uh, that have sort of led us in this direction of a total breakdown of communication? Yeah. Or is it... Okay, so how, how would you how would yeah. you explain that? Um, I mean, I think that money in politics has mm-hmm. created an environment mm-hmm. to where the people in Congress are uh, really, if you ask me, they're mm-hmm. all on the same team when it comes to fiscal mm-hmm. and how they want to handle cor- how they want to deal with corporations and mm-hmm. uh, big money. And what they've done in order to differentiate themselves, because they're all the same, is who's for gay marriage and who's against gay marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they're all the same, (laughs) except we got to find a social issue Mm -hmm. that that makes us different. Mm -hmm. And when you when you start when you have to build a platform on social Mm -hmm. issues, when it just comes down to that, and it's no longer about the role of government in your life, and it's no longer about Mm -hmm. uh, fiscal policy and it's mm-hmm. all coming down to right. who's going to be for the rights of this particular XYZ group of people mm-hmm. um, you, those are highly charged emotional mm-hmm. conversations right. and that is bound to make people really upset you mm-hmm. know it's kind of like discussing religion mm-hmm. at the family dinner table right. you know yeah. with mm-hmm. guests <laughs> who are of a different religion you know um, you're bound to hurt feelings you're bound to create a real division and because government has decided to start focusing on that more Mm. so than focusing on fiscal responsibility or fiscal policy Mm. or social programs or a new deal um you know they're they're focusing so much on and it's if you ask me it's because they're all in bed with the same people so you know all the research i've done Mm. is there's some people doing it more than others but they are all trying to keep a group of people happy Mm. And that group of people is their big money donors. And with those big money donors, they don't want to they don't want to topple the system. Um, and so they have to create something else to differentiate themselves. So, so it so sounds what, like you're saying that, uh, excuse me, I was just going to say it, it sounds like you're you're saying that these social issues are sort of leverage basically as a distraction in, in order to get people sort of arguing I mean, about them. Yes. While and no. there's sort of a bipartisan corruption going on behind the scenes. The social issues are important. From. Okay. So it's not necessarily a distraction. Mm-hmm. Um, they are important, but I do think that they are used as just the primary differentiation. It's like, okay, if you're a racist, you're a Republican. Mm-hmm. And if you're for civil rights, you're a Democrat. Mm-hmm. And it's just not the case, right? right? Uh, Republicans fundamentally have had an ideology about how of, about role of federal government in your life mm-hmm. over states' rights right. um, and fiscal policy. Mm. that that's always been the differentiation mm. well theoretically should be the differentiation between republicans and democrats the actual mm. role of government in our lives mm-hmm. and it's just come down to this which is an honest conversation we can have right well so, and we should, well, we should be having be that to, yeah, yeah we absolutely because that's actually what's going to affect your life mm. um you know a lot of these rights for example and this is why we're seeing a lot of people on you know in the democratic party start to scratch their heads and say i don't know if i'm a democrat anymore mm. you know you're seeing this a lot in the gay community mm. um there's been kind of an exodus where some of them are like well you know, we got gay marriage. And so now I got to look back and look, you know, what, what do I agree with here? Right. There's nothing else. I, you know, mm-hmm. actually, I really want lower taxes and I want, you know, t- you know, whatever. So I'm gonna Dave go. Rubin is kind of a guy. Da- like right. That, exactly. Right. That's an exact right. example. Right. right. Where, you know, if you no longer have mm-hmm. this social policy to fight for, mm-hmm. then you start examining them on a fiscal level and you're like, mm-hmm. well, so, I was going to ask you, Kim, based on what you said, the premise that there's sort of broad agreement within the mainstream of both parties that we can't rock the boat too much. Right. We have to pay attention to our special interests. Like, yes, we have our overall agendas, but at the end of the day, we need to keep power. We need to keep our donors happy. So I'd ask you what you think about folks like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, whose you know primary approach seems to be saying exactly that. We need to get money out of politics. There's folks in both parties that are doing this. And this issue of corruption, special interests, and inequality is ultimately the defining issue of our time. Because I'm not really hearing that from, well, traditionally, I haven't really heard that from mainstream candidates on either side, although I think now in the 
2020 Democratic primary, you're going to see a lot of Democrats sort of taking that position. And it's also interesting when you think about how it corresponds with populism that resonates on the right. Mm -hmm. Because you saw that from Trump with, right, Right. the drain the swamp, although, you know, I would argue that that wasn't really the case given (laughs) the the cabinet that he appointed. Yeah, right. So I'd just be curious. Still pretty swampy in there, you think? Yeah. The swamp? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, still pretty swampy. swampy. Think about who who his cabinet is. Yeah. That's what I'd say. But so what do you think about Elizabeth Warren and and Bernie Sanders and, and folks of that ilk? Love them. I want more of them to run. Tulsi Gabbard is another one. I don't agree on, uh, you know, everything she has said either. But I, I feel like the more the merrier. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can get more people in on that movement, who are uh, progressives in that way, I know a lot of Democrats, a lot of mainstream Democrats are using the term progressive, mm-hmm. um, and I take issue with that a little bit because mm-hmm. to me it's a very specific movement. I think that's um, a co-opting. On their yeah, part. I just think it's yeah. you know, be, and it, it was because Would Hillary really, Clinton have qualified as a progressive. No, and, no, not at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of them that are going to start running are not progressive either, you know, and they, and they kind of, they start to take some of the progressive, um, platform a little bit and say, Oh, I'm not going to expect, I'm not going to accept corporate PAC money, but mm-hmm. that's such a, you know, corporate PAC money is so specific. You can mm-hmm. get corporate money in other ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really like that they're running. I would like to see, you know, somebody that I, I don't agree with on policy. I don't like their voting record is Beto O'Rourke. Mm. Um, I would not vote for him. I don't like his voting record. I think he's a moderate. I think he's mm. almost a Republican <laughs> looking at his voting record. So you'd um, stay home or lodge a protest vote rather no, than vote I, for him if he was the Democratic nominee? I mean, no, I would vote for Beto if he was the only one. And the reason is because I like he doesn't take money. Mm-hmm. The thing about Beto is I just, he's his personal ideology Mm-hmm. is one that I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. So you're not going to take all this money, but you're still going to be mm-hmm. um, kind of a moderate, con- you know, in line with big money. <laughs> and it's because he's personally rich and he mm-hmm. comes from a very, oh, very well. That. Yeah, he's personally got like 10 million bucks and he comes from a billionaire. His father-in-law is a billionaire. So he's got his own personal worldview that he inserts into politics, but I can respect that it's his. Mm-hmm. And it's not. And this is the same with Republicans. I would respect a Republican mm-hmm. who came to the table and said, I'm not going to take big money. Mm-hmm. Um but I've got this idea of how government should be, and it's different than mine, but at least I know they're not bought. Mm. And that's what I want in all the politics, is at least for them to not be bought. But the, here's yeah. the thing, the, what's going on in Congress is that they're all bought by the same people, except a couple of groups, and that's what they've got us fighting on. Planned Parenthood exclusively donates to Democrats. Mm. NRA exclusively donates to Republicans. Right. Mm-hmm. So they've got us on these issues that are moral issues, right? Mm-hmm. right. Um, and that's what they've got us fighting on. Otherwise, Obviously, there's policy implications to what Planned Parenthood and NRA advocates. Of course, but, right. But Which they is both why go right to the heart of differing cultural sensibilities. They're just like and this. I think that's what you're right. speaking to. Everybody yeah. else is donating to all of them. Mm-hmm. Everybody else, you know, with healthcare, banks, sure. They're all with everybody. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to regulate things like our medicine. They don't want to uh, get in the way of the banks and mm-hmm. real estate and all of these other things because they're all getting money from them. Maybe some more than others with different issues. You know, one party gets a bit more than the other, but they're all getting it. But there's these these special interest groups which are very divided, and that's what they keep us focused on because if you're a Democrat, you're going to focus on that. You're not getting a dime mm-hmm. from the NRA. Right. So you're going to keep people fighting about that. And same with the with the Republicans. If you're a Republican, you're not getting a dime from Planned Parenthood. Well, you know, it's you know, it's uh, interesting to me. So you have you, you have the narrower issue of money in politics and whether or not money, you know, counts as free speech. Do you agree with Citizens United no, and so yeah. forth? And, you know, me neither. Right. But, but, then, but then there's but then, of course, there's just this larger issue, which you're also talking about, which is the influence of special interests in, you know, in politics yeah. on uh, our members of Congress and our elected officials in particular and the degree to which they have to rely upon funds, whether donated directly or to political action committees and so forth. Um, to get them, you know, to get them into the door. Uh, now, I, I, I think I mentioned to you too. I talked to Chank Uger a while back, and um, about this, uh, about sort of where the consensus lies between grassroots people. Thank you, between grassroots people and the parties. And I can remember Chank doing a segment about Dave Bratt, who uh, Karen, I don't know if you remember Dave Bratt, but he yeah, just took t- down Eric Cantor. Yeah, right. He was the Tea Party populist, uh, uh, the Tea Party uh, candidate who took down Eric Cantor, majority leader of the of the of the uh, House under John Boehner. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Cantor's 
platform was about basically uprooting Wall Street and special interest influence from Congress and from the Republican Party in particular. And if you go back to the polls uh, around the time of the Wall Street bailouts, and I'd you know I'd be interested to know whether or not you how you felt about that at the time, but you know I think large majorities of the American people were opposed to bailing out you know Wall Street with taxpayer money money after arguably, and I would I would say, and then the austerity that happened right after that. It was like okay, sure. we're going to use our money and bail them out, and then we're not going to use any of our money to help us. Sure, because regular people are still getting their houses repossessed while Wall Street executives get started golden, raking in the dough. Yeah, they, they did better than they've so ever done. So even before you know, even before Trump came along, and even before Bernie Sanders ran, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Ron Paul on the Republican side basically made his impact by saying that this is this is a corrupt way of doing things. Mm-hmm. And so that's what Shank and I were talking about was just the fact that you look at ordinary Republicans and Democrats, and there's actually a lot of agreement that this system is you know sort of rigged and corrupted. But you go to Congress and there's also a bipartisanship that goes in the opposite direction that seems to be invested in sort of you know, somewhat keeping that status quo. Oh, they quo lo- yeah, they of course want to keep it. And, and I don't want to straw man <laughs> Why would they that, give up their luxury I, life? Right, right, yeah, and I don't want to straw man the position entirely because you'll have people who will make arguments along the lines of, well, look, I mean, you know, industries have to be able to lobby, right? Industries are also major players sure. in the economy. Yeah. They're not just, you know, caricatures of robber barons. You have real people who work for corporations right. and who are competent and offer good services and they deserve a say as well. Um, and I but, agree with that, yeah. But you were talking about, uh, actually, I, I saw a video that you did the other day um, about uh, the political article that was written about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Which yeah, is, how the establishment Dems are trying to rein in on her. Right, exactly. Sort of making the point that she was trying to sort of go too far, too fast, and that she was being too, not enough of a team player because she was calling out members of her own caucus and so forth for sort of, you know, for, I guess, being in bed with the special interests and, uh, you know, being a part of the problem in these areas. Now, as a Republican, I, I, I have been critical in the past about and, you know, there are things that the Tea Party was talking about that I that I agree with, things that they talked about that I disagreed with. Uh, I, d- I definitely thought that there's changes that needed to be made in certain cases in terms of reining in what I felt to be the excessive role of the federal government in mm-hmm. our lives. But having said that, I was always a little bit critical of, like, you know, of, of people in, uh, in the Tea Party and in the Republican Party who would say, who would say, look, we need a revolution within the party that happens, you know, right now, immediately. And if these more established Congress people, you know, don't toe the line, then we're going to primary them and we're going to take them out. Uh, In part because, one, I thought that it contributed to sort of the breakdown of the conversation. Because I think that when people are talking out of fear, you don't always get honesty. But the other thing is that it kept some rational centrist policies from being able to take place because people on the uh, in the center right were being pulled way to the right and therefore were unable to reasonably talk to Democrats. So mm-hmm. I'm just wondering, do you think that there's anything to the argument that some of these other Democrats might make to say that, you know, we sympathize with what Ocasio-Cortez is saying, but maybe she could be a little bit more diplomatic? Or do you think that it's just, you know, burn it all down, full steam ahead, you know, uh, rip the curtains off the walls and let's let's start a new. Yeah, I think it's burn it all down. Okay. And mm-hmm. I think that's what Trump mm-hmm. represented for a lot of voters. And well, I think right. he's just a symptom. Mm-hmm. He's not the problem. He is a problem. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. I think the guy's a problem. But he is a symptom of mm-hmm. a greater problem. And he's just the manifestation of that. And I really firmly believe that if we don't get that under control, he's just the beginning. Mm. He is not the worst. We right. can see worse. And you know, every time there's a president that we just think is terrible, uh, a, a worse one can come along. So, uh, you know, I, I thought W was crazy. And then we get Trump, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I love W. Bring him back. You know? <laughs> Bring him back. I'll do anything to get George W. Bush back. Remember those Miss right. Me billboards? Or yeah, miss gosh, me it's George true, w. right? We all and miss them. So Bill Maher said he put one of those pictures up on an episode of uh, Politically yeah. Incorrect. He said, miss me yet, W. And then he said, now I do. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, so um, it can Trump always did get come worse. to where he is by speaking to to yeah, that to, to that sentiment to, yeah, yeah to that sentiment and you know a lot of people who feel I think I mean they may be you know populist on the right and so forth but really do feel kind of similar to how you feel about the corruption and whatnot. yeah and, absolutely I don't you know, think what I'm saying is a, is a particularly liberal position mm-hmm. I have liberal ideology beyond that but I can't even come to the table and have the discussions that I want to have with politicians because I feel like they're not representing me mm-hmm. they represent their special interests they mm-hmm. represent um, they just represent big money 
the people that are giving them money. And you can't really blame them mm. because of course, right? If you're gonna, if you need money for your campaign and someone comes along and is gonna write you a $10,000 check, mm. um, they're gonna wanna come and ask for a favor. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you're gonna have to, you're of course gonna be friendlier to their to them and what they mm. want than somebody else who you've never met or have never donated to you or maybe they only gave you 10 bucks and this guy gave you 10,000 bucks, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So of course, that's human nature to do that. So the problem is really in the system and I think anyone can be corrupted in the system mm. um, and unfortunately so many of them are and the system in itself is corrupted. Just the things that they say. And that's why Congress. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez feels like she has to be so aggressive, right? Well, because I just she, think, sort of, she knows she's going into an environment that's yeah. probably going to try and co-opt her in the way that you're describing, I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, unless they can corrupt her not, early, not, which not, they're not trying to. Not to take you off your yeah. point, but yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I also think the um, backgrounds and characters of candidates is really important, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you see you know, a lot of this burn it down rhetoric among a lot of candidates, but then you have to look about where are they actually coming from, right? Right. Think about Donald Trump, you know, born into a lot of money. Right. Um, you know, sort of built his business empire through corruption in a lot of ways. And then you compare that to someone like Ocasio-Cortez, who was not born into that, you know, who worked as a teacher, mm. who seems to have legitimate roots and connections to her constituents. So I think sometimes there's a, a a desire to sort of make these generalizations and, and draw these comparisons, which I think in terms of underlying dynamics have some value, but I think the actual character and backgrounds of a candidate is super important. Yeah, I agree. It's apples and oranges. Well, I agree. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that character and background matters. That's what I'm saying I, about Beto. You know, it's like, I, li- I can respect that he's not taking money, that he fundraises on small donors mainly, um, mm-hmm. but... I don't agree with his I, his personal ideology and what he would vote for, mm. but I can at least respect that it's coming from an honest, more genuine space. But his background matters, right? Because he's got ten million bucks. He's richer than Ted Cruz. Mm. People didn't even realize mm-hmm. that during the election. That's they right. made Ted Cruz seem like the big boogeyman who had all the money, and it was really mm. Beto with all the cash. <laughs> Did you guys but see Ted no Cruz idea. with Beto's the beard? Bucks. Yes, I think he looks better with the beard. He looks honestly. real, I think, much better. Yeah, I think he's. I, I tweeted that. I said he it. should. He should have been having the beard the whole time. All along. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I still. I don't like Ted Cruz, but yeah. Um, well, you know. Yeah. I, so, um, but I do want to say. I mean, with respect to background and so forth, I do want to say something in in Trump's defense, and even to, to really uh, to, to compliment him here because Whoa, he he. Oh, I know it's ta- <laughs> taboo, right? Taboo. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I I think that Donald Trump signed a very important and a very positive piece of legislation. And I don't know how how you feel about this, but I feel like he signed a very important and positive piece of legislation with the criminal justice reform mm-hmm. uh, yeah. that came through, right? And I think that that bill uh and you know there's still room for good faith people to to disagree on this of course but it represented a consensus across party lines that has been a long time in the making and matured at i think literally the most unlikely moment imaginable like right on the cusp of us going into the government shutdown under the most controversial whether you like him or hate him the most controversial president we've had in modern times uh, and a person who's obviously looked at as you know being you know potentially racist or bigoted what have you Mm -hmm. i mean just objectively speaking that's how many people see him and and, um excuse me uh, and yet uh, a genuine sort of good faith conversation started a while back that actually blossomed even at this very moment and mm-hmm. has given us what I think most observers would look at as some real progress on an issue of tremendous importance to Americans, you know, to American society generally and to many vulnerable people right. in particular, right? Coming in and out of the, uh, uh, and having to deal with the penal system. As a matter of fact, we have an article that should be coming out uh, today, I think, uh, on uh, on uh, betterangels.org uh, uh, about this, written by a fellow named Arnie Steinberg, who's a friend of mine, Republican strategist out of Los Angeles, who worked on many high-profile campaigns, not a left-leaning person by any means, but he looked at the issue of criminal justice a long time ago and sort of saw some of the some of the unfairness and inequality at place uh, in that issue and has been working across the aisle for probably, you know, probably well over a decade, maybe two, uh, to get this done, and it's actually happened. So it does seem to me like when we talk about the importance of rehabilitating the conversation, let's say, Mm -hmm. you know, there are practical dividends to be paid from that, that 
you know, that indefinitely include, but also go beyond just our psychological health in dealing with each other, mm-hmm. right? A reformed approach to talking about politics and actually having a good faith understanding of things and, you know, trying to align interests, you know, on both sides of the conversation really can lead to political progress. I think mm-hmm. I was very encouraged by this bill because I thought that that proved the point. And I'm just wondering if you were encouraged by it as well. Yeah, you know, and he's signed some other pieces of legislation that I've agreed with. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think everything he's doing is mm-hmm. not, you know, not everything is <laughs> <laughs> right. awful. Right. There have been a couple of other things he did sign a piece of clock right twice a day yeah right right, exactly (laughs) well also why did he sign it right like did Mm -hmm. he sign it because he truly believes in criminal justice reform or did he sign it because his son-in-law told him to i mean i don't think he has a a core ideology i mean if you look at his um background he's really taken the opposite tact on criminal justice yeah but but, but, but there's there's a degree to which that's not necessarily the point though right i mean i do understand in terms of you know evaluating a well, person see, like, on their, on, on their character and right? so forth, right? Um, so. But, you know, I do think it is a, a good habit for us to get into to incentivize people doing the right thing in Definitely. office. Even if, you know, I mean, look, a lot of people get into politics for reasons that are not, you know, totally related to moral right. purity and so forth, right? Just as a just as a general rule. So as constituents and so forth, I, I think it's good to, to, to look and say, hey, look, I, I may not actually personally care for this person at all. But you did the right thing, and I want people to see right. you clapping for it because I want <laughs> right. you to do, to well, do more we right do, things. Right, praise if we, where if, praise is due. Well, exactly. and if we praise him more often when he does the right thing, maybe he'll do it more often exactly. because he'll see that he gets <laughs> the true. praise he, does, he likes praise. He does right, like right, the right. praise. Yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> That's tra- how you curry favor. Tra- right, exactly. Training the president, I it's like dealing with a bad about. child, right? You just ignore the bad part. Whenever they're doing something good, you're like, good job! And then they do it more and more because they're getting the attention. Right, right, exactly. right. <laughs> That's what we have to do with Trump. <laughs> there, there was another issue that I wanted to bring up with you um, uh, as we went into the final final minutes of our uh, conversation. Uh, and that's the issue of the, uh, the Me Too movement. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you and I have ever talked about this. Uh, I, I mean, you know, last time we had a Close conversation was, I think, before the hashtag Me Too movement popped yeah. up. But obviously, the issues that Me Too is responding to are mm-hmm. just go back deep in our national psychology. Before we started um, recording today, uh, for folks listening, uh, the three of us watched this Gillette c- commercial. Gillette, the the razor blade, uh, you know, uh, company. But for people who haven't seen it, uh, it basically was a commercial that. Uh, sort of talk to men in a way that Gillette has never talked to men before. So, I mean, I'm trying to think the last time I saw a regular Gillette commercial, but I seem to remember them as just being, you know, Gillette, the best a man can get. And, you know, just like, you know, men, strong, tough, right. but also clean and handsome and smooth shaven <laughs> when you when you use Gillette. But this commercial... Like me. Like you're, that's right. Uh, yeah, I probably got a little stubble going on. Uh, but this commercial was more about... Um, uh, highlighting what people call toxic masculinity, uh, it showed uh, it, it it showed uh, uh, groups of teenage boys chasing uh, younger boys down the street. It showed uh, images of men kind of ogling women and making lewd comments mm-hmm. behind their back. It showed guys at a grill just kind of ignoring their friends as they were doing these things. And it the ad made the point like you know we can do better right. and so forth. And there's been a mixed reaction to the commercial. I mean, it was definitely well produced and put together in an inspiring way and so forth. Mm-hmm. But some people felt like, like, okay, this is great. This is what men need to hear. Other mm-hmm. people felt like, dude, let me just buy shaving cream and don't, you know, hit me with the social, you know, social argument. And you guys are making men in general look like chauvinists, and most of us are not that way. So some guys are taking it as, as offensive in that sense. And I think it it comes out of this broader sort of issue in terms of how people are looking at the Me Too movement where you have some people who say, okay, look, Me Too is doing incredibly uh, good things and we need to go further and hold men more to account for their behavior and so forth. And then you have other people who are saying, okay, yeah, it's responding to a real issue and so forth, but it's also uh, possible uh, to go too far too fast. You guys are allowing certain men who really are innocent to be made vulnerable to false accusations. You've had some... And I forget 
I forget the names <laughs> at the moment, but you've had some relatively high profile left wing journalists and so forth sort of make the point that if a few innocent men got to go down by the wayside for this larger movement to succeed, so be it. So this is the range of reactions people have been having to Me Too in general. And I'm just wondering, sort of, how have you responded to yeah. this movement in particular? And do you find things to sympathize with on either or both uh, both sides of it? I mean, first of all, I think it's great, and it's really about time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been the victim. I've got my own Me Too story. Mm -hmm. I think most women do. If you've made your way mm -hmm. in in a corporate world or you know in in big business, you're going to just come across bosses that are going to take advantage of you mm -hmm. as a woman, sure. and it puts you in a situation where you don't really know. Um, you know, for me, for example, I had built my career. And I was al—I already had the dream job and mm. what I wanted and everything that I could possibly accomplish, and more so than most people in my industry at that mm. point. And then to have my boss uh, take advantage of me and put me in a position where I didn't feel like I could say no, mm. because I felt like I would lose everything I worked for. Mm. You know, it wasn't about Jesus. when they they talk about oh, women sleeping their way to the top and all of that stuff. And it's just not like that. That was demonizing to mm. women to say, oh, well, that's what they're doing. And a lot of it was, you just didn't want to lose what you had, what you had worked for, honestly and legitimately. Um, and so I do think that, sorry? No, just, just fascinating um, point, yeah. I, I do think that it's, it's such an important movement because there just is so much going on with being a woman that is dangerous or that puts you in a position that's compromising. And mm -hmm. men do get it too. There are, it's mm -hmm. not just women by any mm -hmm. means, it's majority women though. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I definitely think the Me Too movement is mm -hmm. great and it's about time. I was mm -hmm. actually one, of, and, and I, I also find it interesting that um, I'd be really curious how my fellow liberal friends would feel about Hugh Hefner today. Mm. But after he died, I made a real strong point saying, this guy was no friend to women. Um, and I can't even tell you the backlash I got from liberals and yeah. from Democrats. It was like mm. he was a you know he was team blue, mm. and how dare me say anything against this person that I firmly believe put women in a position of of painting women as needing to be these sex bunnies, mm -hmm. and that's it, and that there was nothing better than for a woman to be big breasted yeah. and blonde and waiting for her man at home, and that was it, and that mm. was after World War II. Europe did the sex revolution very differently than mm. the United States did. The United States introduced Hugh Hefner and Playboy and told women to go back into the kitchen. And Europe didn't have half their men because they were in the war. The war was mm. on their turf. So they needed the women to rebuild. And the way that women have been able to, that's why you see all these women leaders in Europe and you don't see them here, right? They've all, mm. Theresa May and uh, mm. you've got Ang Angela Merkel over there right now. And well, several, we could have had Hillary Clinton, right? And we might have Elizabeth uh, Warren. And sure, and yeah. I mean, but, but way later than them. I mean, the British guy, they had a female prime minister in the 90s. You know, mm. I mean, they're way ahead of us. And if you look at the composition of Congress, Oh, yeah. Even now, after this freshman class, which I yeah. think has the most women of all time, I mean, it's, it's still, still such not, a small right. minority, Compared especially among the Republican Party. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're just further advanced, and it's because they didn't shove women back into the kitchen. And when they had their sexual revolution, which anyone, you know, when they say, oh, Hugh Hefner ushered in the sexual revolution of women, bull. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, what? There's Europe, a feminist, there's a, a pro feminist narrative that says that, you know, uh, what Hefner did was in some way empowering to women. No, it wasn't at all. Being and able to own no. their sexuality and uh, no. exhibit themselves. It was, wasn't. You don't think that was taken back I know back for sure power. it wasn't. All you have to mm. do is look at Europe and how they did it. They mm. did it completely differently. Mm. They well, don't, and it, Hefner ultimately valued women for their looks. That's right? the thing. And in mm. Europe... So I don't see how that's that empowering. Mm. It's not but at I'm all. I'm just saying that there were... There were uh, I'm not saying I think this. I'm just saying that that was a narrative that was on you know prevalent on the left for some time. I, oh, I yeah. Guess. And that's why when he died and I spoke out against mm. him, I said this guy was a... De you know, I think he was the, the single largest war factor that demeaned women. Mm. I mean, I could point right. it at Playboy and Hugh Hefner. Mm. I really think that that was the turning point for women that really put us in a situation that made our lives worse mm. overall. Yeah. When you look at Europe, this, you know, they, they say, oh, he ushered it in, made things more free. Are you kidding me? Europe, mm. they watch porn on actual network television. <laughs> it's literally on like their ABC Saturday <laughs> nights. Uh, anybody can turn on the TV and see this stuff. And oh that's because they, they were further, they, they were freer, mm -hmm. but they did it in a way that wasn't demeaning to women. Mm. They did it in a way that wasn't um, 
So, you know, I would be really interested to see now, after the Me Too movement, how fellow liberals and Democrats view Hugh Hefner in this new light, mm. uh, you know. Well, it's also interesting to think about the comparison between the United States and Europe, because obviously the United States was originally built by the Puritans. So it was a group of people who left Europe mm-hmm. because they were basically like, whoa, we want to be way more puritanical like right. of Massachusetts, right? <laughs> right? So I do think there is sort of this. And then if you look at just traditionally how people have responded to sex scandals. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It hasn't been in that kind of open and frank way that you see in Europe. Oh, they mm-hmm. don't even care. They're like, right. oh yeah, the president's got a mistress now. Oh, well, anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. You know? It's funny that you mentioned the Puritans because when Hugh Hefner died, I mean, when Hugh Hefner died, I was thinking about him more because I, I wrote something complimentary about Hugh Hefner when he passed. And I was thinking of him in the context of his support for the civil rights movement and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of, the, some of the things that he did to champion social causes in the 60s that I sure. was certainly been allied with and i got blowback from two groups of people folks on on the left like uh, yourself who said well wait a second like his legacy is strictly exploitative and so forth you mm-hmm. look at how he built his i don't read playboy or anything like that but i just you know i just was thinking about it in a different context so i got pushback from folks on the left like yourself uh, making those sorts of points yeah and the other group i got a lot of pushback from was my religious conservative friends of course <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. From, uh, but also you know for but for similar reasons that you know that ultimately he he degraded uh you know degraded women in a way that kept people from recognizing their god-given value and so yeah. forth mm. as made in the image of god that he debased them uh, in terms of his work and so yeah I'm, he made women a, a like an a, actual objects. You know, women were to commodity, be collected. Commodity yeah, that, to be way, collected right. and tossed mm-hmm. once they got too old. And mm-hmm. you know, he had like seven girlfriends at one time, and he painted the mm-hmm. picture of this is the ultimate male. This mm-hmm. is how you are a man. Right. Um, so I really think you know for the Me Too movement that it's extremely, extremely important that it came about. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, th- I still think that there is some work to be done. That being said, mm-hmm. I do have some friends who were victims. Mm-hmm. Um, in the way that they were the good guy that had to take the fall. Mm. And mm. a friend of mine, for example, I just I couldn't believe this was actually happening to him, mm. but he lost his job and his reputation was smeared for, um, for being the manager over a guy that did something. Mm. Right. And because he was the manager and it was and it was reported, they did go to court and his name appeared in the court filing. And so because of that, he was like connected Mm -hmm. in this way and people just felt like he didn't do enough as a manager at the time. I feel like... Well, you see that happening now with the Bernie Bernie campaign. Right. There there are a lot of people coming out and, you know, credible allegations of harassment on the campaign. And I think originally Bernie's position was, well, I was a candidate. I didn't know anything about this. And then wait, at the end of the day, like the buck stops with you. Mm. And so how much of that... You know, because there was always the Bernie bro criticism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that's something he's going to have to contend with. Right. And Joe Biden, too. I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at Joe any... Biden's history, <laughs> I mean, gotta... if you look at the videos of him kind of welcoming I've the a... new families mm-hmm. to Congress, mm-hmm. like super touchy <laughs> with the I mean, I've got a Joe Biden any... <laughs> story. Uh, not with him and me personally, but those. I mean, uh, I think anybody it, yeah. is going mm-hmm. to have a history that is good, that, you know, I think all of us. Mm. Um, have a, something in our history. We right. said something. We had certain positions mm. that we right. that maybe now we we've changed our minds. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done things in the past that were acceptable at the time that are not acceptable today. Mm-hmm. I don't think we should be judging people on that. That's where I disagree with mm. how far things have gone. When mm. like the Twitter mob goes after people yeah. who maybe yeah. said something mm-hmm. on Twitter ten years ago, right. I think that's outrageously mm. ridiculous. That's right. how I feel like I'm a real liberal in that mm. I feel like um, I am for. The, the concept of evolution of people right. and people ha- you know give people freedom so what about people, the, people the should Kavanaugh. be allowed to change and people should be should be allowed to be to, I think if it's forgiven. criminal yeah. that's mm-hmm. a totally different story mm-hmm. if you are allegedly involved um, or being accused of some kind of criminal activity then you should mm-hmm. have to take responsibility for that that is not something we can sweep under the rug to say oh well you maybe raped somebody 30 years ago but that was 30 years ago and you were a kid no I'm sorry yeah, you know if we find out you murdered somebody 30 mm-hmm. years ago you would go to jail well, for that. Yeah, I, I, I don't hear you as saying that there shouldn't be accountability, right? Just that there should be an avenue. And obviously, certain situations are much worse than others. Right. But in, as a general rule, there needs to be an, uh, there needs to be a real window for forgiveness and redemption, right? Yeah, if it just comes and, down to you said something, 
um, or something happened while you were the manager and you didn't and at the time you know you guys handled it but you handled it to the level that was acceptable for the time Mm -hmm. you know like parents used to belt their kids Okay. Yeah, right. These days, if you take a belt to your kid, you're going to go to jail. Mm-hmm. But we can't start throwing press parents charges against my mother. Right. Well, you know, and a lot of those parents are alive today. Right. So are we, what are we going to do? Are we going to go after all these parents that belted us when we were kids right. and say now you need to go to jail for child abuse? Mm-hmm. At the time, it was an acceptable form of punishment. Mm-hmm. There were things that were acceptable at the time um, that were not criminal. Right. That were acceptable. So it's an important distinction. Yeah, right. right. So it's got to be criminal in order for us to say we're going to go after it. Mm-hmm. Or it's got to be so severe in its nature, like right. Harvey Weinstein, for example, repeatedly uh, getting rid of women that weren't willing to sleep with him. Right. If you were abusing your power over and over and over again, mm-hmm. and it wasn't criminal, but it was definitely a violation mm-hmm. of your role in that job, yeah. um, then also, yeah, you got to go. Mm-hmm. You know, but well, if we, if we had if we had the time, we uh, I think we could jump into a deeper exploration of this issue of call out culture and so forth. Yeah, uh, mm. we don't have the time, but that just means that you got to come back, <laughs> please, and, uh, yeah. please. And, or and, have us on a, a show. Yeah, a I podcast. would love to have you guys We're, on mine. Yeah. We're available. We, yeah. we, we ain't doing nothing. What are we, what are we doing later? Uh, just, yeah. just, <laughs> That's just, right. Just bring us on. Come be on yeah. my show. Absolutely. That'd be great. Actually, Absolutely. yeah. Karen, any final thoughts before we wrap? I really enjoyed this. It's good to have a guest, John. Mm. It's good to have somebody who can challenge us on our positions and to get into some of this deeper stuff on Mm. immigration and the Me Too movement. So we'd love to have you back. Oh, well, thank you. Agreed. Kim is very challenging. 100%. 100% agree. (laughs) Where can the people find you, Kim? Uh, Well, you can go to theleft.com, and that's where you can get, uh, I've got a podcast, a daily podcast that goes there as well. A daily podcast. It's a daily news 15-minute rundown, but I'm, uh, yeah, going to be interviewing some people on that one as well, and it's also a daily Mm -hmm. newsletter. Mm -hmm. That's Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, you can go to Mm kimiversonshow.com, and that's where you can get my uh, longer form kind of stuff that's way more on the progressive side. On the left, we try to keep things a little bit more um, in, you know, encompassing of the big tent mm-hmm. for the Democrats mm-hmm. and and liberals in general. Mm-hmm. But on my personal show, the Kim Iverson uh, Kim Iverson Show dot com, that is way more of my. Uh, where I get called a right winger sometimes and more progressive ideas and where I call out both Republicans mm. and Democrats and I just want to kind of burn the whole system mm. down and start yeah. over. That's kind of So depending on what flavor what flavor of Kim people are looking for, you can yeah. get I, I try to keep either it, of those places. Try to keep it neutral for the uh, as neutral as the left can be, okay, right? Gotcha, but I right, right, try, yeah, yeah, but for my sure. personal <laughs> politics you can find at Kim Iverson Show. There you go. Well, yeah. we'll throw up some links in the uh, description below uh, for this video, whether you're listening or watching. And to everybody who is listening and watching, thank you very much. Let's go out and depolarize America. Peace. Peace.